everybody. I'm Nico Ronquilio. I'm one of the first year residents. Um, I'm going to be talking about today about uh, macular telangiectasia. There's been a lot of studies. Uh, it's been a hot topic in the last uh, several years. And I just wanted to go over uh, natural history and the research that we are conducting to help uh, uh, identify uh, genetic uh, causative uh, mutations uh, that cause uh, macular telangiectasia. So let me start with a case presentation. Uh, this patient is a 21-year-old male that was seen last year around uh, July that was referred for blurry vision uh, that he noticed, especially when he was uh, driving. Uh, pretty healthy guy, no other past medical history. His father and sister has a history of a shark of married tooth that is uh, being followed in neurology. Uh, he has two uh, siblings total, including the sister, which uh, uh, has no eye problems that they report. And the father has a macular problem that uh, he says he's had since he was 30. The um, rest of the history is uh, uh, non-contributory. His examination on this first visit was uh, 2100 and 2080 on the left eye as a best corrected vision. Um, his pressures were normal, pupils were uh, equal in no APD. The rest of his exam is uh, normal. Just of note, he does have some slight uh, decrease in his uh, uh, collar plates, so three out of eight uh, uh, plates in the right eye, five out of eight in the, in the left eye. His anterior segment was otherwise unremarkable. So these are his uh, fundus photos, and just wanted to point out a couple of uh, pertinent findings. The first is we can see this like graying of the macular area in, in both the right and the left. That's one of the first uh, things I, 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 I saw. The next thing is there's this pigment clump. I don't know if you can see that very well, uh, temporal to the macula. And then finally, just looking at the fovea, the fovea just doesn't look uh, normal as well. I would characterize this as having irregular uh, pigmentation. Um, that is probably a little bit more pronounced in the left compared to the right. But you know, the rest of uh, his fundus look normal, optic nerves look normal, and the periphery look normal, which I'm not showing here. Um, in, in infrared, what I wanted to point out is that you can see these uh, little spots of uh, hyper-reflective uh, 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 spots, more pronounced really in the right eye compared to the left, but you can see it as well in the left. On OCT, these, uh, the top portion is the right and uh, bottom is the left. I just wanted to go through this, you know. Uh, you can see loss of, or irregularity and loss of the ISOS uh, junction. Uh, the outer nuclear layer, especially centrally, is lost as well. You can see the inner nuclear layer is also uh, uh, disrupted. And there's these little hyper-reflective spots just along the inner nuclear, uh, the inner uh, retina as well that may correspond to the hyper-reflective spots as well. Finally, there's this hyper-reflective cavity uh, centrally. The left eye shows uh, very similar findings with lots of ISOS junctions. The outer nuclear layer, especially in the center, is also uh, uh, disrupted. So on fundus autofluorescence, what we can see is a hyper autofluorescence in the fovea uh, seen here. That corresponds to that kind of uh, uh, hypopigmented spot in our fundus photograph. And his FA, these are, the top portions are uh, FA around one minute, and this is a little later, around nine minutes. And I'd like to uh, draw your attention in the left one. There's uh, leakage uh, that is more pronounced temporal to the macula in the left eye. And in the right eye, there is a little bit more diffuse um, uh, leakage early on. And obviously, uh, in uh, the later uh, FA stages, there are leakage that is in a wreath-like distribution in, uh, in, in both macula. So the Goldman visual fields has, he shows some uh, central scotoma in, um, in, in both eyes, the periphery looks normal. And finally, we, we uh, got a macular pigment measurement. And for those of you uh, th that don't look at this uh, every day, so, uh, it, the, so this is uh, his right and this is his left. And usually what we should see is um, uh, the highest concentration of pigment in the center, so a little bit more white. Uh, and here what we can see is a ring of white, which uh, corresponds to macular pigment, and in the center it's absent. This is a little quantification, and there should be a peak uh, um, uh, early on. 
and the same is for the, uh, the left. And I'll show you a little bit more about uh, uh, the normal macular pigment uh, in literature in, um, uh, in the next few slides. So just you know, lo looking at this uh, afresh, the differential diagnosis, of course, includes macular telangiectasia with all of his uh, findings. Best disease is also um, one of the considerations. We don't see uh, that vitelliform yellow lesion that we usually see in best, but you can also see that in macular telangiectasia. But its absence really doesn't rule it out. We did get an EOG, which was low normal, and actually talked to Dr. Creel about the, the results of this. Uh, another another uh, consideration would be cone dystrophy, given his uh, decreased color, um, as well as the, that loss, the central loss of uh, the outer nuclear layer. But uh, his uh, it was reassuring that he had normal uh, full field ERGs. Other less likely considerations would include Stargard, AMD, and uh, medication uh, uh, toxicity, which he does not take any hydroxychloroquine. So now let me talk um, a little bit more about macular telangiectasia and its natural history and what we know and what the studies are uh, going to be showing in the next few years. So this is also known as idiopathic juxtaphobial telangiectasia. Uh, the, there are really not a lot of studies. There's two studies looking at the prevalence of the disease. So historically, we've always thought that macular telangiectasia is a very rare disease. But from these two, the, uh, these two studies, it seems like it's, uh, it's not as rare as we thought. The first was the Beaver Dam study done in Wisconsin, and they enrolled around, um, uh, around 5,000 patients, and they found five patients retrospectively with uh, characteristics of MACTEL. Uh, another study in uh, Australia, the Melbourne Collaborative Cohort Study, also showed um, they had 22,000 patients in their cohort, and they found one patient, so a prevalence of around 1 in 20,000. And both studies did comment that they may be underestimating the prevalence of the disease, just because it's a retrospective study as well. So people now think that this may be a little bit more common than what we initially thought. We do not have any data suggesting that males or uh, females are uh, more commonly affected, and so and then this, this macular telangiectasia is likely autosomal dominant uh, because there is a vertical transmission from both males and females. The uh, macular telangiectasia has been um, described uh, uh, for several years now, but in 1993, Gass and Barbara uh, Blody uh, classified uh, the different macular telangiectasia into three types, which I won't go over too much, but one of the things I wanted to point out is the type 2, which we now call MACTEL, is a bilateral compared to the type 1, which is usually unilateral and has other uh, findings. But the disease can be definitely uh, be very asymmetric between both eyes. Lastly, uh, Dr. Blody, when she moved to Wisconsin, published another paper in 2006 uh, with Yanuzi, which uh, reclassified the disease. Uh, and this is what we're using right now um, to understand the natural history. So from these studies, uh, the, the earliest finding that we know from macular telangiectasia is, er is leakage temporally uh, in FA. So these are the, uh, this is an early FA time point in this uh, upper inlet and uh, a later FA finding and we can see uh, uh, leakage in the temporal region of the macula. The fundus really is unremarkable. The only thing is a non-specific loss of foveal reflex. This is another uh, patient just showing you uh, the early finding of uh, FA leakage. And so really, at this point, the FA is still gold standard for diagnosis of uh, MACTEL. In stage two, uh, macular telangiectasia, now we can see uh, more characteristic fundus findings. And it doesn't show up here nicely, but there is um, uh, some retinal gray, like I showed you in the patient more temporally, which can extend uh, more in an oval-like fashion to cover most of the macula. Um, and so this is uh, stage two. And the FA here just shows you a little bit more leakage as well, temporally and concentrically. Stage three uh, of macular telangiectasia is really described by blunting of, uh, of uh, the vessels. And here is shown that usually they should be tapering off um, uh, and have a smaller caliber, uh, but they uh, blunt off. And that's one of the characteristic findings. 
There are also these uh, crystalline deposits uh, that is seen in this disease that could happen in any stage. Uh, crystals can be found in several other, uh, in several other um, diseases. We don't really know the composition of these crystals, but people think that these are precipitation of uh, several macular pigments, uh, lutein, zeaxanthine, mesozeaxanthine, but we don't really know. The other, the other finding is this yellow lesion, like I mentioned to you about, that could be characteristic of best disease as well, that is present in a, that could be present in any stage of macular telangiectasia. Lastly, in stage four, uh, which we think is the most severe, is a presence of a pigment proliferation or these hyperpigmented uh, spots, um, and also accompanied by RPE atrophy. Uh, rarely, we can also see presence of a macular hole and a macular telangiectasia. Now, the natural history of macular pigment is even uh, less well understood compared to the fundus findings. Uh, and just as an aside, you know, the MACTEL project is conducting a natural history study, uh, which is now underway, so we'll have a little bit more data. So, but uh, in this study, th uh, this, is, uh, this is a normal um, eye. So this, is, this photo here is actually from the lab of Dr. Hegeman, and we can see this yellowish um, uh, pigment in the center, uh, which corresponds uh, to macular pigment, and we can see its highest density. Now in macular telangiectasia, we can see what we're looking at is the dark spot in here, uh, temporal to the macula, and that suggests a loss of a macular pigment. And that can progress encompassing a little bit more of the temporal side of the macula, and even more um, correspond, uh, the loss of a majority, you can see that there's maybe a little bit more left here inferiorly, and it just progresses. This is another post-mortem, which really shows the difference of the macular pigment being in the center and it's a little bit more dispersed. Now, uh, as, a, as another aside, we, we, it's really poorly understood what's happening in the pigment. We know that there's definitely loss of pigment in the center. We don't know whether the pigment is dispersed um, and moved out or whether um, this is normal pigment surrounding it. it. Just That just gets accentuated after the loss of the pigment centrally. And no studies I've looked at, no studies have really quantified the density of the macular uh, pigment uh, in, in that ring. So now to switch uh, gears, I wanted to talk about a little bit more about MACTEL genetics and how we're contributing to uh, finding the genetic mutation. Um, but at, to this point, uh, there are no positive genes uh, for MACTEL. There's not even good uh, animal models for macular telangiectasia. Now, just uh, a week ago, this paper uh, with our collaborators got published in, in Nature. And this is, uh, and, and just to highlight uh, a couple of things, this is the first paper that identified three ident independent loci with several possible genes uh, in this. And they, they have a nice, uh, a nice story, but they've never really shown any causality for any of the genes that they've identified. The other point that I wanted to take is that they do have a lot of patients, but the patients are not related uh, for these studies. And after calculating, really, they only estimate 5% of uh, the estimated heritability uh, for, for, for these findings. And so really, it's still wide open, uh, the, the field of genetics. And so the, the real goal for the studies is to be able to recruit large, very high quality families uh, with macular telangiectasia and we're in a great place to do that. So the MACTEL project is an international research co uh, collaboration that was uh, founded in uh, 2005 or started in 2005. And we are one of the centers and we are currently enrolling patients and their family members that, has been, uh, that we think has MACTEL. Most of our families are from Utah and Idaho. And when they come here and we usually screen them on a sar Saturday mornings, we bring them here and they get a battery of tests, which I've shown you, but also we get blood for them to get some uh, uh, basic lab work, of, including hemoglobin A1C, which we, uh, we think is associated with the disease, um, as well as uh, um, isolating uh, blood, uh, DNA from this blood and isolating lymphocytes for iPS cell gener generation. We send all these data to the London Reading Center in, in Moorfield uh, Hospital for confirmation. 
and all of our probats that we have here has been confirmed to have MACTEL to this point. So now, you know, all of our, these, so now I'll be showing you all of our families. And again, I think we really do have the best families uh, of macular telangiectasia in the world that we have compiled so far. So I want to talk about this uh, M65 uh, F472 family and the, and the names are just for, for the study. This is actually our patient. This is the pro band that we have. This is our 21 year old diagnosed with MACTEL. He has two sisters. His dad, we brought him in for the study and and uh, we did uh, show that this is his dad's uh, fundus photo, and he just has this like you know characteristic pigment clumping of uh, of macular telangiectasia, and we did all the tests and and sent him to the reading center and confirmed to have MACTEL. So this is very uh, interesting of in itself. This is one of the uh, uh, earliest known onset of uh, macular telangiectasia in the literature, with a known um, with a known uh, parent affected by the disease. Now, you know, I al we also collaborated with a Utah population database. So we have, you know, around 50 probands. And the question was, are any of these probands related and so that we can make a super family? And indeed, this family is related to another family that we're studying that are related um, up in here. And these red circles correspond to all the patients that we've already recruited and phenotyped. And, you know, these black things correspond that they do have uh, confirmed with macular telangiectasia. So th these are very, very useful resources, um, having uh, big families uh, to find the genetic mutation. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that we're uh, understanding right now is one of the exclusion of the disease of, this, of the study is we don't screen patients uh, less than 30 years old just because uh, we did not think that we would find macular telangiectasia. But now we are also getting maybe <coughs> children, younger children uh, above 18 to see whether they're really affected. Uh, the next several slides is just showing you how extensive our families are, not really trying to draw any conclusions, uh, but this is another family, the P48 uh, at 4156, and I just wanted to emphasize that we prioritize recruitment, so patients in families who are multiple members are affected, so the more siblings, that's where we try to get, and you know, the families have been very, very cooperative, as you, most of you know, the hardest part in these studies is recruitment of families. This is another family, and I just want to point out that we also prioritize siblings of affected family members. For example, this dad, we try to get you know, the siblings. And uh, just of note, in this family, we, uh, his, uh, uh, the proband's father, we are still trying to get his two brothers come in. That would be very, very useful for, the, for our genetic studies. Uh, these are uh, our other families showing you that it's still not complete. Uh, we're still uh, 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 recruiting these families, but most of the families we have recruited most, uh, most already. And I've compiled all this data. Um, so one of the, one of the things uh, that we were interested as well is uh, calculating the penetrance of uh, macular telangiectasia, which at this point was just hypothesized to be to be very, very low. Um, and, and just to summarize the families, as I've mentioned, we have around 50 probands that we know has MACTEL, but 23 we have enrolled in the study in clinically phenotype and confirmed by the reading center. Uh, looking at you know, all the genetic studies, uh, people can uh, run into trouble uh, by saying that this is a rare disease, and most of the studies look at the penetrance to be around 10%. But when I actually calculated the penetrance, it's a little higher than that. You can calculate it several ways. You can look at a, a sibling analysis, and you know if if a disease, if, a, if uh, an autosomal disease, you would expect a 50% uh, rate of uh, the uh, siblings affected, but we don't see that. It's definitely less. And after calculating it, we see that there's around 41% penetrance. Uh, when I calculated the penetrance with a parent analysis, the penetrance is a little higher, but at the same time, we don't have a lot of families that, have, that we've recruited both the parents and uh, the siblings as well. So, you know, one of the conclusions is that the penetrance is higher than uh, previously thought, and I'll show you why this could be important as well um, uh, later. So just to uh, end my talk, you know, MACTEL is characterized by temporal leakage on FA, decreased central macular pigment, and this temporal pigment clumping that we see. Uh, this, is, uh, this case that I've shown is one of the youngest patients reported to be diagnosed with MACTEL. And 
you know, uh, one of the clinical things that we can uh, draw from this is when we see a patient with a MACTEL, uh, we can let them know if uh, their siblings um, or uh, if they have children that the risk of developing MACTEL would be around 20-35% uh, based on uh, these uh, penetrance estimations that we've had. The last thing I'm just going to talk about is, you know, MAC, there's just a lot of studies with MACTEL right now, and there's a lot of emerging uh, imaging modalities, and I think we'll hear from uh, one of our uh, 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 visitors, Lydia, in the next several weeks. She'll be giving grand rounds on, you know, really uh, FLEO and uh, the cool things that she's been seeing uh, with macular telangiectasia. Um, I did not show uh, our other research projects with, uh, with the families, but I just have to acknowledge a lot of people that is involved in this study, including, of course, uh, Paul Bernstein um, and a lot of other people. I'm working with Alan Thomas with uh, calculating all the penetrants, and I've worked mostly with Jathene uh, and the Utah Population uh, Database. So with that, I will take uh, any questions that you may have. So let me back up. So your the neovascularization of a MACTO is very interesting because compared to other diseases, we think that it's coming from the outer retina and not from the choroid. So that's of in itself is very, very interesting. You can see neo I did not show that in the natural history because it can actually, in the new uh, classification, it can show up anywhere. So now we call this non-proliferative or proliferative. Um, but you do see it more commonly in uh, later stages of disease. But there's some reports showing it as well in like stage three or stage two where there's just retinal grading and maybe just a neovascular membrane. Um, so, and to answer your question, in our families, m many of our families do not have uh, <coughs> neovascular complexes. So I really can't comment much more about that. So uh, you said that the Provian's father had a uh, sharp and gray tooth. Do you, mm -hmm. uh, you've been looking at these other families. Do, did you see that uh, greater incidence? No, so I think that's just a red herring. And from the genetic studies, actually, we know their mutation for shark tooth yeah. um, already. Uh, but the associations that we know of that are strongest in a macular telangiectasia is a high A1C. Um, diabetes is one of the uh, common. But there are also papers suggesting that, uh, you know, the initial studies were just um, uh, uh, were confounded. Uh, high BMI and smoking, uh, but no other really kind of interesting uh, associations. It's a good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you.